Okay. So we're excited to have Chuck Riffenberg with um, his business, The Rogue Herbalist, and I love that name. <laughs> um, Rooted in Vermont has been doing this week-long um, collaborative with the Vermont Department of Libraries throughout the state and bringing various programs. It's a grassroots movement. And, and basically, they're wanting to take kind of the, um, the trendy thing out of, you know, the whole local food Basically, let's increase consumption of local food and keeping the money in our own communities and so forth. And I think we're all a part of that. And so um, this has been sort of the underpinning of this week of Rooted in Vermont. And then again, there's been um, various and sundry programs. We had Kathy Dodge, who is with um, Healing Leaves, and she spoke of Rooted in Your Backyard just the various roots you can find in your backyard and on the fringes of your backyard. And now, Chuck tonight is going to be talking about CBD and um, how it is a boon to Vermont's craft herbalism you know, industry. And um, Chuck has the Rogue um, Herbalist, which is his own uh, creation of his tinctures and um, teas, and, and you, I know you could probably explain it better than I, but sure. uh, I know Chuck through the Sunflower Foods, and he's just a wonderful resource. Um, just you go in with a cough or you know an itchy throat or whatever, he gives you something, and you go, "Whoa, I'm healed." I mean, I know it's not that simple, but that's how it works for me. <laughs> so, without further ado, I just want to turn it over to Chuck and have him share his experience with all of the herbs that he crafts, he wild crafts, and and what he puts together. And we're so pleased to have you, Chuck. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Hey, thank you, Judy. Yeah, you're welcome. Great. Thank you guys for coming out, too. This is uh, nice. Sorry we don't have it up on the big screen, but I have a little screen for you. So. Yeah, work. Yeah. So just to speak on the point of local foods and local medicines is really key. Um, it's been part of my whole philosophy for a long time is uh, you want to be sourcing as much food and medicine as you can from the eco-region that you live in. You know, it's going to be uh, more attuned to your own physiology. You think about people go and get local honey for the fact that the bees are pollinating flowers in their local area, so you're going to be more attuned to what's, you know, the, the pollen that's in your air. Uh, so we do this with everything, really, if you think about, you know, whether it's the beef that you get at the grocery or, you know, should be as local as possible, should be as high quality as possible because that's your health. Uh, so to speak on CBD and hemp, I've uh, been a fan of cannabis for a long time. It's you know, like one of the original medicinal plants that we all discover when we're younger. Um, how has uh, the CBD hemp been a boon to craft herbalism in general? Just speaking about my business, I knew it was the time to finally kind of pull the trigger on this thing. I've been wanting to do this as a business proper for many years, but uh, this was the time to do it because there's so much interest in cannabis in general now, and it's really uh, affords us a good opportunity to kind of build bridges with people who might not otherwise know about plant medicine. They come into it, you know, I work at the local health food store, the Sunflower Natural Foods. You guys all know me from there. Right up the road here on 100. Yeah. Right in Waterbury Center. Okay. Yeah, just past uh, Ben and Jerry's on the right. Okay, I didn't know that. So, but I'm the herbalist there uh, for John and Pam, and uh, yeah, that's how I came to know Judy, and that's why I'm here right now. Uh, local herbal medicine is really important to me. Uh, so, you can see on the screen here, that's the hemp bitters in a nice background. Um, just to start off with, like, the history of hemp, I like to talk about, this is a guy in 1910 in Michigan farming his hemp crops, so this is not a new crop by any means. This is part of American history, you know, the Constitution was written on it. Henry Ford's hemp car, you know, check that out. There's a lot of uh, history to the plant. It goes back further than in the Americas, obviously. It goes back to China. Like I said, one of the original medicinal plants. Uh, for seed, for the fiber, you know, for the flowers. Um, it's really kind of funny that, uh, you know, people have kind of been asleep for the past hundred years around this issue and due to prohibition and all these things that have gone on. So we're just now kind of coming back to where we ought to be as far as uh, incorporating cannabis and medicinal plants in general into our lives. Most people don't think of plants for medicine still, which is uh, strange to me. But you can see on this picture, this is uh, some patent remedies from uh, the late 1800s and early 1900s. So a lot of people don't know that you could just 
A hundred years ago, you could walk into any pharmacy and you could buy a product just like this. It's just a tincture of cannabis. In this case, of high CBD hemp grown in Irisburg. Uh, I'll talk about my buddy's business in a second, but uh, primarily uh, the difference, probably what they were taking back then was uh, THC tincture as well, but that's what's kind of nice is we can specify our medicines and kind of tune them to what you want them to be. Um, this is, uh, yeah, quite a good medicine for reasons that I'll go into here. Uh, I should also say as a caveat, like anything I say is not medical advice. I always like to just put that out there just for uh, any FDA type of thing going on. So some of the different farms that we buy from though, because we don't just make this pure hemp tincture, we make all different formulas using local uh, medicinal plants from Foster Farm. Um, and some things as well that are sourced from out of country, but we have a rule that every ingredient we source is of the utmost quality, so everything is either uh, organic, wild crafted by us, or locally sourced, which is also organic. Uh, all the foster farm herbs there that you're drinking now are organic and really high quality. So. It's and it's quite good. Yeah. <laughs> so this is, just while we're talking about that, it's anise hyssop, Chamomile, lemon balm, oat straw, and Tulsi, or holy basil. Really nice combo. Holy basil. Yeah, lovely adaptogen. So, uh, Creek Valley is my friend Kyle in Irisburg, Vermont. You guys may have seen the kombucha back there. We'll show some pictures of it as well. It's the best kombucha with CBD in it. Uh, each big bottle is 50 milligrams, really good dose. You can break it up into one, two, or three servings, and you know, or just take a little shot of it at a time. Um, Scrivener maple provides us uh, both maple syrup and uh, reverse osmosis maple tree water, which is the water that we use in all of our tinctures. So the alcohol we use is organic cane alcohol, really high quality. It's the industry standard. We'll mention that again in the future here. Uh, and the water is literally from the trees. So I'll kind of talk about that as well. Um, and then too, you know, just as far as local goes, we're working with all the different local businesses. So Websticker and So did this new label design for me, printed them off. We try to go local when, when at all possible. Um, and then of course, uh, all the retailers and stores that carry our products. We're in about 20 stores now across New England. So we're, we're very small compared to a lot of the bigger CBD companies, but that's, you know, can be a blessing and a curse, I guess, depends on how you think about it. So. Everything's very small batch, but everything's also of the utmost quality. So, continue on with that. There's Kyle's kombucha. I definitely encourage you to at least have a taste of it. It's uh, ginger CBD kombucha. Um, it's the same hemp in his kombucha that's in our tincture here, and our formulas as well. Uh, I went to his land. He's going to show you some pictures here of the land. So they're actually currently in the midst of renovating this barn. Uh, so that's another thing that's important about the whole uh, boom to the economy about around hemp is a lot of these Vermont farms are coming back to life. As I'm sure you guys have read about a lot of these dairy farms that are going under, you know, or you're growing hemp and able to uh, make a living again. We want to see that with more than just cannabis too. We want to see them growing all kinds of medicinal plants. Um, you can check out his Instagram for more pictures of the barn renovation. That's the only one I have. I did a little trip up there a few weeks ago to take some pictures. Uh, just to speak to the quality of his farm, you know, there's organic, like USDA certified organic, and then there's like proper organic. Like a lot of people understand that the meaning of organic has been diluted over the years. Regulations allow you to have so many, you know, parts per million of this and that. And so what he's doing is proper organic. There's no pesticides of any kind. There's uh, the only fertilizer that goes in there is all like truly organic. It's uh, pig and sheep manure and compost as well. So they're, one of the key goals that he has for his business is, you know, enriching the life of the soil. That's so important to grow healthy plants. And you think about the mess we're in with uh, monocropped agriculture right now is, you know, exactly what we want to avoid with cannabis going forward is just this repetitive cycle of putting in, you know, the same three chemicals every year and depleting the soil of all its other micronutrients and, you know, proper uh, organisms too. Like there's. People don't know about microbiome. This is why people take probiotics and you know things for your gut health. It's the same thing across the landscape as well. They have this saying, as above, so below. It's just throughout the whole landscape. Um, so he's really keen on uh, keeping his land as healthy as possible. Is it GAP certified? Is it like GAP? 
I don't know what kind of certifications he has. I just know that it's extremely good quality. Yeah, it's very, um, very difficult to maintain that kind of. Um, yeah, and there's biodynamic certification, and there's all kinds of cool certifications out there. And I'm really a fan of uh, these different voluntary programs where people can go and you know you bring your stuff up to the level of yes. these different accrediting bodies. So, but yeah, there's. Uh, no pesticide of any kind, no artificial fertilizers or anything synthetic, no black plastic. You see a lot of farms, and I'm not bashing the people with black plastic, but he's proud of the fact he doesn't use any black plastic. It's all, everything he does is by hand. It's, it's similar to my operation. His is, it's a small farm, even though they have quite a bit of plants out there. You can see him there uh, watering some plants in the greenhouse and then uh, bigger crops in the field there. That's just a you know snapshot of the field. He's got quite a few fields over there. I think they have maybe 10 acres that might be wrong too, I'm not sure. But we walked quite a ways, I'll say that. Mm -hmm. um, speaking about the health of the ecosystems, lovely picture of these ladybugs. So <coughs> talking about like the microbiome of the landscape, there's ladybugs, there's grasshoppers and crickets and all sorts of different plant and animal life that is out there with these plants. It's not just monocrop cannabis, like one after the other after the other. There's all kinds, you know, red clover and all these different plants growing amongst them. So it's, it's really a diverse ecosystem at work. And you want that because it's healthier for the plants, it's healthier for us. Um, and two, the plants adapt to their environment. Uh, one of the things Kyle does on, on his farm is he has a section that's very low lying and a lot of water gets in there. It's cold and damp in this one part of the farm. So he'll deliberately uh, plant like their test crops in there so that they have to deal with the most sort of adversity. And the ones that, that survive and thrive, they go in and they gather seed from them and perpetuate those good genetics. Mm -hmm. So he's, he's breeding with a purpose as well, as opposed to just breeding for volume, which is kind of the trap we got in with agriculture in the last century. You know, They're just breeding for maximum yield, but you lose a lot of micronutrients, you lose a lot of beneficial chemistry while you're doing that. Uh, so it's, I was stoked to see all the ladybugs that day. There was <laughs> tons of them. Uh, just the animals on his farm there. He's got a ton of these, uh, I forget the name of them, they're an heirloom pig from England, um, and then all kinds of sheep as well. Uh, all kinds of plants on his farm there, nice sunflowers and cherries. There's a lot of fruit out on that property, so it's truly a, a living ecosystem and not just uh, like a monocrop farm. You see some of these uh, hemp farms, depends on where you're at, but you want to know where your hemp is coming from. You want to know where all of it's coming from, ideally, but just speaking about hemp, you know, is your hemp coming from a farm like this where there's all kinds of life, or is it coming from a farm that's, you know, smack dab between two GMO cornfields and, yeah. you know, propane tanks and stuff going on? Like, that's, I saw that today, as a matter of fact. So, you want quality is the main thing. Um, speak about uh, Foster Farm as well, which is what we're drinking right now. I got to go there a couple of years ago and uh, help do some farm work and, you know, shuck some garlic and whatnot. It was a good time. But these guys are, uh, Definitely doing it the right way and uh, growing all the time. So definitely check their products out as well. I think we're going to start carrying them at the Sunflower so you can check it out there. But they're all over the place as well. These are just some of the plants listed on there that we have uh, in our formulas. Um, like I said, we're drinking chamomile, anise hyssop, uh, milky oats, and the Tulsi. And lemon balm too. Yeah, I, yeah, I thought the person said ayahuasca. <laughs> I'm like, what? No ayahuasca in here, but, but, but ashwagandha, you know, is a lovely adaptogen yeah. uh, in, in the hemp adapt. Just nice pictures which people will be able to see on the uh, presentation when they look at it online as well. So this is angelica and chamomile growing. That's two of the uh, main herbs in our hemp bitters that we make. So really, uh, as, ma as many ingredients as we can get that are locally sourced, we try to get them all from these guys. Uh, St. John's wort and lemon balm growing there in the hemp nerving that we make. It's a lovely product. Um, delicious. Aromatics and everybody knows St. John's wort. Um, just really awesome farm to check out. Um, and two wildcrafted medicines, as Judy said. I've done some talks here at the library before about wildcrafted medicine, mushrooms and different plants. Uh, there's nice photos here of the reishi harvest last year. Uh, reishi mushroom being uh, one of the key herbs in our hemp adapt formula. So I keep saying adapt, adapt. Uh, I don't know if everybody knows this concept of an adaptogen. Basically, it's a class of plant that uh, helps you become more resilient to stress. Um, there's a whole literature on adaptogens. There's more stimulating ones and more calming ones. 
the reishi, uh, it tends to be considered more calming, but you do find people that occasionally can be uh, kind of, you know, excited by it. Can be stimulating to some. Uh, so, there's a chaga mushroom. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll speak briefly on chaga as well as a medicine, because uh, people are concerned about over-harvesting of it. I have a rule uh, when I go out, I only really take a piece that I'm able to just break off easily with my hand. Um, and there's a reason for that too, is it doesn't reproduce like many other mushrooms do just by casting spores. So the, this black piece that's the actual medicinal part is a sterile conch. It's just, you know, part that grows out of the tree uh, that you, you know, make, that we make into this formula here. But if you take the whole thing out, then it won't actually reproduce itself. That won't happen until uh, the, the mushroom has basically consumed the entire tree and the tree has died. Um, and then elsewhere on the tree, what's called a resupinate will grow out, and that's what casts the spores. So if you, you know, if you hack into the tree and you take the entire thing, uh, it's not good because it won't be reproducing itself. So we want to be mindful of wildcrafted resources as well. Um, you can get, uh, like Paul Stamets on the West Coast is doing great work. Uh, if you guys haven't seen his stuff, he makes medicinal mushroom uh, products. And they're actually uh, cultivating the mycelium, the little white rootlets of the mushroom itself. And that's, you know, that's quite a sustainable way of doing it as well. But we make this uh, because there are virtues to the fruiting body versus just, you know, the mycelium. They're, they're two different things. So we make this in small batch. Uh, it's just one of four mushrooms. Uh, we actually won an award on this product. Uh, it's four mushroom immune complex. Uh, definitely check it out, please. Try to move it along too. There's me with Chicken of the Woods last year. <laughs> um, that's a great uh, edible cul culinary mushroom, but as well as medicinal properties as well. Another good tonic mushroom. You know, a lot of these things that are like tonics and adaptogens are bordering on both uh, food and medicine category. And you can consume them regularly, daily without any kind of problem. What's the definition of a tonic? Just think about like the way your muscles will have tone to them, if that makes sense. And like, yeah, that's kind of the old school definition. It's like, an, it's back from uh, the 1800s this word came about. But like I would say it uh, tonifies you, makes you stronger, makes certain, certain organs can be uh, toned by different plants, you know. You think of uh, milk thistle as a popular liver tonic. People take it for the health of their liver and so forth. Um, it's kind of a broad term, but I like it. Um, tonics are safe um, and you should have them every day. So just speaking on the mushrooms again, uh, you try to dry them in the sun whenever possible. I say wherever possible because it's not always possible. Uh, you might be out on a rainy day, which is typically when you do find mushrooms. So it's not always possible to sun dry them, but the reason you do that is because, just like when we're out in the sun and we make vitamin D, so do the mushrooms. Kind of makes them, uh, makes them better. Uh, making the product. So, just to speak about making the tincture itself, it's really simple. Like, anybody can do this. Um, and hopefully people will be doing it more now that there's going to be such a glut of hemp on the market. And hopefully the price will be coming down. Um, we're actively trying to make that happen as well. But this is uh, really simply, uh, it's one to three, which means for one part hemp, there's three parts organic cane alcohol. Um, so the, the ratio we use is 834 grams of ground cannabis to two, you know, 2.5 liters, 2,500 milliliters of alcohol. And that fills a perfect batch jar, one gallon jar. <laughs> that'll, that'll macerate in the alcohol for at least two weeks and then we press it in the hydraulic press there, and it makes it, you know, very strong, very good cannabis tincture. Um, Do you dry out the tincture? It's dry, yeah. Right. yeah. I have some great CBDs that I worked at the Dog River Farm for four years. And, nice. Um, uh, so I, I know George, and he gave me some, and they're really great, but sure. I don't want to make a tincture or something with them, and I have no idea, like, do you dry them? Or you definitely them? want to dry when you're making a tincture. Right. I suppose you could, you could, um, you could make it out of the fresh, but you would definitely be wanting to use the, the pure alcohol, 95% yeah, or higher, because yeah, yeah, exactly. of the water content in the plant. It's dry. You want it, yeah, we dry, yeah, it's dried and we Absolutely. grind it and then it's tinctured. Because too, you'll make a more potent medicine if it's dried. Yes. So, yeah, sure. but it's not to say that the fresh doesn't have value as well, um, and I'll speak to that as well. So, 
the formulas though, this is, there's no water in this, it's just alcohol and cannabis, just two ingredients, really simple. Anybody can do it. Um, you know, I encourage people to get mine because it's organic cane alcohol and really good cannabis, but I do encourage people to make their own products. Isn't it more commonly it's being put into oils? Yeah, that's right. I'll speak to that too if okay. you like, so. Um, let's see what happens uh, just next though. So yeah, so why, why do we do a true tincture is basically the same question, because most everybody is doing oil. You see oil in everything. And one of the main reasons I wanted to do a proper tincture for sale is because people come in looking for tincture for sale, and they say, do you have any CBD tincture? And all these companies are selling their oil as tincture. So I said, well, it's, you know, you always go through the talk like, well, it's not actually tincture, but it's oil. So this is a true tincture. Um, there's different ways that uh, these oils are being made. Most of the oil on the market, it seems, is uh, CO2, supercritical CO2 extraction, which is basically high pressure CO2 becomes liquefied, and then it's run through all the plant material. And that yields, you know, really efficient extraction. Um, the other way is to make a tincture, an ethanol preparation, and then it goes into a device that's called a rotary evaporator. Basically, um, it's basically just cooking it at a low temperature, but with the rotary evaporator, it keeps a constant temperature and you're able to draw a vacuum on it so you can boil it at a lower temperature. It's essentially uh, a lab piece of laboratory equipment that you can acquire and do that with. Um, I wanted to do it at home. Yeah, you could you could build such a thing. I've been wanting to build my own, or you can just buy them on the internet too. Can you just more simply do it without that? You could, yeah. Like, but here's the thing uh, that I'll speak to is the reason why we don't do that um, is I don't know if you can see the chart very well. I show this chart to people all the time, but so it's it's the range of cannabinoids that you're extracting through these different modes, and they talk about uh, decarboxylation. Yeah. yeah, you know what that is? It's the heating of it. So when you heat it over, there's, uh, there's different cannabinoids here. This is CBDA, which in the living plant, it's all CBDA. It's in the acid form. It's, uh, you know, there's no CBD until it's heated. Um, so this is basically a more uh, kind of natural uh, collection of cannabinoids. You know, there's both the CBDA and CBD. They both have uh, redeeming values, medicinal qualities to them. Um, let's see, I'll pick up here for you. This talks about all the use of the A. So just to speak to the A, uh, and so CBD itself is crossing your blood-brain barrier. That kind of gives you, um, you know, this sedative, anxiolytic, calming effect that people are looking for. Um, and a lot of people do report back that they kind of feel like they get high from CBD. But I think if you take a high enough dose, you'll definitely feel what they're talking about. And it, it's not a THC high, but it's its own kind of experience. Um, one, that's one of the myths that surrounds CBD is that it's not a psychoactive constituent. It actually is, just not in the same way that THC is. Um, and that's not a problem either. Um, let's see. So, but CBDA is not able to cross the blood-brain blood barrier, so it stays systemic to the body and has an anti-inflammatory effect in that way. Um, this next one should say, yeah, so there's research uh, that you can go find that talks about it as a COX-2 inhibitor. It's the way a lot of our anti-inflammatory drugs work. I think when people come in uh, looking for the kind of uh, aches and pains of, you know, relief that they want of CBD, I think uh, a CBDA product is a better choice or something that's more balanced. Uh, there are companies that make products with both or just CBDA. You know, there's all kinds of stuff on the market that's available. But if you're looking for it for, for joint pain, uh, CBDA is what you would want. And my friend here brought up, you know, the raw plant itself. I think what we'll probably start to see in the future is a lot more uh, juicing of the cannabis plant as well. There's such a, such a huge amount of uh, fresh plant material. Uh, I really think that these guys would be selling their fresh plants to these juiceries and places to make fresh cannabis juice out of. Or just, you know, incorporating it into other juices as well. Because well, kombucha is a great idea. Yeah. Well, and the, the kombucha is uh, with CBD, not CBDA, but wow. you, could, you could still do that. You can really make whatever you want for products. So is there a way to, from the normal plant to get the CBDA? Either you consume it raw, or you would consume it in a tincture like this where there's no heat. Beauty. Yeah. You could just Beauty eat. gets rid of the A. 
Yeah, correct. Which is still okay. Like that's that a D card box. Or... Yeah, that's exactly what that so is. So we're so most people want to get rid of the A. Well, yeah, I mean some of them do. Why? Well, because the the CBD itself gives you that more calming and anxiolytic effect and, and helpful with sleep and. Yeah, and A is really more, and think about it like this too, is the molecules are very similarly structured. Mm -hmm. All the cannabinoids are similarly structured, so they're doing similar things in the body. If you read like, I don't like thinking of it in terms of what does this one do precisely, and what does this one do? They all kind of do similar things. Um, yeah, but that's why I am a proponent of uh, more whole plant medicine, yeah. Truly, um, yeah, closer to nature, I would say. So this, this talks about it as um, an anti-inflammatory and also good research as an anti-emetic. People that are dealing with uh, chemotherapy or just nausea in general, there's a lot of gastrointestinal stuff out there now uh, for numerous reasons. Um, so here's another one on CBDA talking about it um, in being studied in breast cancer. You know, we can't make any claims about that, but you know, when people do have that question, I point them to the research. Like it's not as if this research doesn't exist. You know, it still astounds me that people will comment on herbs and supplements, vitamins and things, and they say, oh, there's no research and that's not regulated. Like, that's not true at all. Like, yeah. it's very well researched and there's actually quite a bit of regulation around them. So, uh, we try to point people to the research. Um, this piece here talks about the synergy of all the constituents. So, um, this is what would be considered a crude extract. Like you've just made it very simply in alcohol, it's a crude extract. And people will try to uh, act as if these highly refined oils are a superior product to a crude extract, when in fact uh, herbal medicine sh shows us otherwise, you know. There's plenty of uh, examples of other plants where they'll remove a constituent and they're just testing, you know, one standardized constituent and it will not work as well as if the whole plant were administered because these all these different chemicals in the plants are working together, like they have a purpose to be there, and there's a synergy that takes place amongst them. Uh, let's see. And I'll just, before we talk about the uh, RO water, um, just on that note, uh, it's not too, I don't want to trash uh, synthetics or standardized products either, because I do believe they all have value, and I do believe they're all uh, therapeutic, or they have their own specific application. I just, but if you were to put a gun to my head, I would say that I think a crude extract closer to nature is a superior medicine. Um, you know, just my personal point of view and philosophy. But I think that we have the evidence to show that as well. Um, and two, because it, you know, people can do this themselves and it connects you to your community, you're able to go to your local herbalist and farmer and, and see the plants and, you know, have a connection with them. As opposed to if you're buying product from the other side of the country or the world for that matter, you have no connection there, and there's all different factors that go into that. You can't account for the quality of the product and, you know, the energy that it took to ship it to here and all these type of things. So. And that's the point of the Exactly. The point of the whole thing, right? Absolutely. So, um, this other piece is really cool. We, we use in all of our tincture formulas, so this is the only one with no water in it. Everything else has some water in it, as well as alcohol. We use uh, reverse osmosis maple tree water. So it's They've taken the maple sap and, let's see if I have a picture. Yeah, they've taken sap, put it in the RO. Um, basically, the reason they do that is because it cuts down on boiling time, and you can save the amount of wood you have to boil. Um, but then you have all this extra maple tree water, which forever people were just you know washing their floors with it. They didn't use it for anything. Just now, we're starting to see these companies come out with beverages, sparkling maple water, and you know different creations with the maple tree water. And uh, Tommy, my business partner, who's not able to make it tonight, but this is from his uh, family's uh, maple operation in Duxbury. So he came up with the idea, he's like, we should use the maple tree water for the decoction process, which is, like you saw the mushrooms earlier, you do what's called a decoction, basically where you simmer, cook them in the water, and that's breaking down all the, uh, the, the chitin, the, cell, the cells that basically hold in the medicine. You wanna break that down by cooking it in the water. And there are water soluble uh, sugar molecules that get released into the water. So we do that, and then that gets combined with the other herbs and the cannabis all into one product. Um, but if you think about this idea of local, like this is literally the rain fell into the earth, and then these trees took it up, turns it into the sap, and comes out, and we take the water again. 
uh, really, it's sort of a, it's sort of an alchemical thing if you know anything about that. It's like taking the pieces of nature apart and like putting it back together in this new form. Um, the water from the tree and these these mushrooms grow in the forest and on the trees and you know hopefully next to the forest is a nice cannabis farm another medicinal plant farm. So it's bringing it all back to, to one uh, medicine. And two, just thinking about the future. Um, I just saw in the news the other day there's going to be a lavender farm in the Northeast Kingdom. That's awesome. I went to one in uh, Quebec last year and it was outstanding. So uh, there's, there's local saffron being grown now. I don't know if you guys know that, but there's a saffron farm in Snow, I believe. Um, we want as much of this as possible and we want to encourage people to buy these products even if they are expensive at first. The, the quality is higher and <clears throat> keep some money local, keep your money right in the local economy. Is it vodka? Yeah, and then, okay, so check this out. Um, the, um, I saw at the farmer's market there's the Caledonia Spirits, I think, is making this maple vodka. And I, I bought a bottle of it for my buddy's wedding as a gift. And I sampled it while I was there, and it's outstanding. So one of my actually, uh, hopefully not too long-term goals, hopefully in the next few years we're going to do this, I want to start making my own alcohol from maple syrup, and then you tincture your herbs in the actual maple alcohol. You know, And then every single ingredient is right from here, as, as close as you can get to this. Because right now the only ingredient that we source that's, at least for these formulas, this series of formulas, is... Uh, right from Vermont, the only thing that's not is the alcohol, which comes from the West Coast, because we're buying in bulk, you know, bulk cane sugar alcohol, organic, you know, it's kind of difficult, but you can't get any more organic than the maple trees, that's almost like a wild-crafted alcohol, yeah. like we use the wild-crafted water there. Um, and I do, I want to do, uh, I want to have my own apothecary at Herb School as well, so that's, when you support local, like you're supporting projects like this that better the community as well. Instead of sending money to Colorado, California, or whoever, you know, not to say you can't do that because there are tons of good products from all these places, but it speaks to the importance of local. Um, I wanted to go out on this note and kind of talk about the past and the future. Um, this is an article about this company, uh, Librete Incorporated, uh, receiving a patent for CBDA, uh, manufactured from yeast, though, so it's a synthetic cannabinoid, even if it's made in a natural process but it's, it's non-hemp uh, CBDA. This company as well, Source Naturals, makes a CBD that's uh, not from hemp at all. It's, manu it's manufactured in a laboratory from uh, orange peel and some sort of uh, pine tree. But it's, it's not real CBD in, in my opinion, you know, because it's not, it's molecularly the same, but it's not from the plant itself. You know, it's been, uh, you know, crafted. Uh, so it's, a, it's not- uh, well, The synergy is lost. Well, Correct, exactly, dude. You know, and we don't want to lose the synergy. The synergy is the most important thing. But just to speak to the past and the future, if you if you read any of the history on uh, how big pharma came in and took over the, the industry of medicine and pushed out herbalists and chiropractors and anybody who practiced any other form of medicine than uh, allopathy, you know, that's been a hundred years we've been at this, and it's a losing strategy. So. Going forward in the in the new millennia here, we need to uh, think about where we're going to head. You know, we can either kind of do uh, what our ancestors did, or we can you know continue on with the same uh, failed strategy, which you know they say is the definition of insanity. So, yeah, but I have high hopes for the future. You know, I keep spreading this message of you know synergistic and uh, holistic plant medicine. And, yeah. That's it. <laughs> Chuck, it's yeah. been great. I mean, I love how you present. And I just want to give a shout out to Chuck Keys. Um, like I said in the beginning, many times I'll go in and say, hey, Chuck, you know, um, what was the latest in congestion? And you turn me on to uh, Ella Campaign. Ella, Ella yeah. Campaign. Yeah. Ella Campaign. Yeah, got it. And I'm like, oh, miracle. You know, it's like all of a sudden it just, sure. you know. And, uh, you know, I know you saw the digestive bitters, and I've done that, and I've had stomach upset, and it's like, to me, it's like a miracle, because it's like, I just took a dropper of something, and, you know, and yeah. again, it's, it's the, the real source is what you're saying, it's, it's, it's you know, unadulterated, and uh, yeah, um, the power is in the medicine. Yeah, and it works better than if you were to just take one of those chemicals out of that plant, you know. Right. It might be helpful if you did that, but it's going to work better if you've got the whole range of chemistry in there. 
Right. You know, people, you know, they act like you have to uh, go through this whole refining process and like, oh, uh, primarily, I guess, is the main reason is that they want to make a product that's going to taste nice. They don't want, and you guys can sample this if you haven't already tasted it, but it tastes like cannabis. Like, that's the only flavor you taste. <laughs> but you want to taste that. You want to taste all the chemistry in the plant. You want to taste the bitter and the pungent flavors that are, and that, that is a sign of pungency and high quality medicine. If you take an oil and it has no taste to it, how effective is it really going to be? Yeah. It might be, it might even test in the thing that it's very high in CBD or whatever molecule you're after, but without that accompanying chemistry, you know, it's, it's not doing what it needs to be doing in the human body. What's well, the difference between white rice and having a brown whole grain rice? Sure. You can have the white processed piece of crap rice so you can eat the real deal. Yeah, that's, that's where all the nutrients are. It's, that's a great analogy. You know how I like to uh, liken it to is uh, if you look back at the uh, cannabinoid profile, like CBD is just one note on a keyboard, you know, it's just one note as opposed to the whole plant, which is like a whole symphony at work, you know, it's all the different chemistry being played, you know, and in the manner that nature put it there too, it's, it's uh, really something. Please. Uh, what about um, eating a few leaves in a salad. It's a great What's idea. the, is it better or, or is some process being left out that is necessary? It's, I mean, you're not going to get as potent of a dose of medicine if you took something like that that has been concentrated, if you're just eating, but it's good to eat a few leaves every day, you know, it is kind of resinous, like you said, but. Maybe you could make a salad dressing with oil. Yeah, right. Something more that's like a great that, idea. That's better than just I saw a meme that was so good, and I tried to find it for this, but it's basically, it's talking about how back when we saw the old guy there growing hemp in 1910, people were feeding <coughs> their pigs and animals uh, the, the leftover hemp, you know? And then the animals are benefiting from that as well. They've got their mammals like we are, they have the endocannabinoid system as well. So, and then that translates into the meat and milk that people were eating as well. So there was, you know, mm -hmm. cannabinoids in the food chain but that's been removed in the past hundred years. So that's, I think, a great point about how people are walking around in such a state of inflammation. You know? So Chuck, to speak to the endocannabinoids that are in our system, yeah. if you would. Yeah. So they talk about endocannabinoid yeah. system. It's basically, uh, it's a regulating system in the human body. Uh, actually, there's uh, cannabinoids in breast milk. There's different phytocannabinoids, plant-based cannabinoids in plants other than cannabis too. Um, Echinacea and prickly ash, these different ones. People are making formulas now that are other plants than cannabis because everyone's still got this taboo around cannabis or they don't want THC or what have you. So they make a formula that's kind of acting on the same receptors, but it's not CBD. It's like that um, Source Naturals one in a way. But it's still at least they're using whole plants for that. Um, but basically, uh, how does it work as far, like the simple explanation that I like best is, uh, there's all your neurons are firing constantly, you know, and there's elect, you know, chemical electrical energy being exchanged. Um, when you're constantly in a state of inflammation, your body is just pumping out uh, pro-inflammatory chemicals, cytokines, and all these different things, prostaglandins. Uh, what the cannabis is doing, how it's having its uh, anti-inflammatory effect, is it's regulating this um, system of communication, and it's basically sending feedback messages saying, we've received the message, you can stop making so much pro-inflammatory chemistry, like we're, we got it, we're good. Uh, that's a simple explanation that was that's told me that I like yeah, it, you know. That's great, yeah, thank you. But, you know, it goes deeper than that, obviously. Yeah. Uh, and that's too, talking about uh, this synergistic chemistry, that's too why we make herbal formulas. Um, we made four different ones there that have hemp and other herbs in them, because people come in looking for CBD for a lot of different reasons, and they don't know why, they just know that it works because it's everyone is talking about it. So we made you know the pure so people can understand what it is on its own, but we also made the formulas that are a little more honed in on specific reasons somebody would want a CBD product for, whether it be stress or you know nerve pain or sleep or digestive issues. The whole range is there. So, yeah, it's a treat. Must be a good lookout. What is good for gout? Is it good for gout? Uh, it probably helps with the pain of gout, definitely. 
What was that? Nothing's good for Gavin. Well, <laughs> well, yeah, well I, 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 I cherry juice. Cherry juice. Yeah, I get random attacks yeah. very rarely, but they Dude, say and actually, it's inflammatory. So. It totally is. And that's like our favorite thing to tell people to put this in is the tart cherry concentrate. Uh, um, it's, it's really good. <laughs> it is good, yeah. It tastes great and it's, it's very anti-inflammatory. Tart cherry is helpful with sleep as well. It's got uh, naturally occurring melatonin in it. Um, and it's super simple. You know, and it's delicious. Yeah. yeah. What did you guys think of the uh, the treats over there? Yeah. <laughs> I ate one. I ate one. Yeah. Brownie was delicious. Feel yeah. free to. Uh, we'll take some pics of the stuff and. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Any more questions or yeah? Yeah. Um, I think I told you I was working with a CBD company and. One of the things that I was learning about their products was about feminized seeds. Right. Are you going to say before we open them? No, it's fine. Can it's you crack into it? Is it what you're talking about taking a picture? It's fine. Crack into it. Yeah, go ahead. Go on. Yeah. Can you talk about the differences between how people cultivate hemp plants, yeah. the optimum production? You know, yeah, and how do they make feminized seeds? I'm not actually really keen on the breeding of cannabis. Uh, that's a better question for my buddy Kyle. But yeah, because they didn't, didn't believe in feminized seeds. I, I agree with that stance too. Just yeah, you shouldn't be putting in hormones in there or anything to influence it one way or the other. Uh, but it's a factor in perhaps in production because you know, and the people to consider yes. when they're looking at plants. Uh, but I'm not sure you can always find out. No, right. That's a really great point. Um, that's one thing nobody's really talking about either. So I know that, uh, like I said, one of the things that Kyle does there at his farm is uh, they just basically breed for strength and quality. Like they, they put those test crops in like the mud, not the mud, but the, the wet part of the farm. And then, you know, that which thrives in the, you know, the harsh Vermont climate is the one that they use. And then do they pull out the male plants or because they're yeah because they don't want to um, you know fertilize their females either because you want not, and that's another myth that would be standard then in all production I think so, so. Curious about how it all works right? yeah but a lot of people are confused and they think like male female plants they think that oh CBD comes from the male plant and THC comes from the female plant like none of that is true at all yeah. it's yeah. the strains of the of the plant that you're dealing with so I just can you. Cannabis sativa versus something else. Well, it's all cannabis, you know. Right. <laughs> and there's different. So yeah, this is a good point for people to talk about. Is so some of, like these bigger companies will sell CBD oil from uh, European grown hemp, like it's supposed to be a good thing. But actually, I don't believe it's uh, good for a number of reasons. One of the main ones is they're growing the industrial hemp for fibers and whatnot. And they're putting it into these, you know, huge machines. So you're, people don't know, cannabis is a chelator. Like it pulls minerals and metals out of the soil. So if there's contamination in the soil, it's also pulling that in there. So that's why people are concerned about, you know, yeah, and the testing of plants, material, and the really the remedy for that is to buy small and buy local and know your farmer, know your herbalist, uh, because if you're buying this stuff from the other side of the world, you you never know what you're gonna get.